Today's guest is Mark Sarabian, the founder of AT Help and AT Train. These are two programs that provide free services on assistive technology in New York City for children and adults, as well as training to professionals. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's absolutely our pleasure. We'll be covering free assistive technology for everyday use today. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. On a materials note, before we get started, we sent registrants an email containing the materials that we're going to be reviewing today. In case you did not receive them, they're available to download at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side. Materials include a link to Mark's full PowerPoint that we're going to present on your screen in a shortened form during the live stream. Unfortunately, you cannot see us, but we're going to try and be as animated as we can with our words during this hour. And you'll be able to review the longer PowerPoint after the broadcast. And if you haven't already seen, we're going to be using a chat box during our conversation. So any questions you may have, please feel free to add us and we'll do our best to answer them. We may end up answering them closer to the end of the presentation, or we may weave them in throughout, as makes sense. Assistive technology, or AT as it's commonly abbreviated, is all around us these days. Although AT is often thought of as tools to help with communication for individuals who are nonverbal or screen readers for the blind, today's conversation will be broader. For example, just about everybody has a smartphone or uses a web browser. Both are loaded with free embedded accessibility tools that most of us know very little about. So Mark, let's kick it off. Could you help us better understand what is assistive technology? Colin, essentially assistive technology is any tool that empowers an individual to participate in their community. The mm. community could be work, it could be school, it could be leisure. Mm. Anything that allows that person to participate with the people that they want to participate with. It's a way to individualize learning, individualize your workload with tools that empower you to do the work that you need to get done. So really it's a tool that bridges the gap between the user and the task that they want to complete. Got it, okay. Could you give us some examples? Um, a person, you know, a child in a school that needs to be able to take notes, but perhaps their handwriting because of fine motor and neurological issues, it keeps them from being able to take notes quick enough. Mm. This allows them to type and to use word prediction, word completion, perhaps record what the teacher is saying, all of these things so that the child can participate at the same level as his peers, go home with adequate notes, and then once again study like everyone else. Got it. Okay. So... I heard you talking about obstacles before and just this idea that assistive technology essentially levels a playing field, right? So anyone can access the task. So the obstacle is kind of the effects of the disability that, that prevents the student from being able to access the task? True. And everybody's disability, even if, uh, even if you would take, say, five people who are blind, they all have different interactions in the environment. So let me, let me give you an even more interesting example. I'll take a child who's blind and a child who has dyslexia, and a child who has a physical disability. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that they actually, in school, all have the same disability, hmm. which is they can't access the textbook. Hmm. So in the long run, it's not the medical definition that helps us. It's that child's own experience in the school that we need to address. How can they access the material like everybody else, participate and learn? Same in the workplace. That's really helpful framing. Thank you so much for that definition. And we have a formal definition up here that comes from the federal special education law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And if you're noting, you know, what's going on with the, the words kind of bordering this slide, uh, we apologize. A couple slides during this presentation may look a little squeezed. That's just due to how we uploaded the PowerPoint. So we apologize for that. So if I draw your attention to the definition, this has been uh, modified with graphics around it by Dr. David Eady, who's really a fantastic writer in the field of assistive technology. If you notice, assistive technology is any, and the word any is magnified there because it's anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will try to draw distinctions and say, Mark, you know, this is instructional technology or this is just everyday technology. Mm -hmm. Assistive technology doesn't matter, doesn't matter what it was invented for. It matters what it's being used for. There we go. So assistive technology, for example, a smart board in a classroom, you might say that's instructional technology. Well, for a kid with gross motor needs, it actually helps them go and participate in math in a physical way. Mm -hmm. So now it's assistive technology. Anything that will increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability is assistive tech. This law was written long ago, and it is still very progressive and appropriate today. Yeah, that's, that's really great to be hearing. So any professionals, any teachers, certainly keep this in mind. This, this framework is really helping me. I'm a former special education teacher, but I didn't feel like I had 
enough of a handle on assistive tech. I think I was always think of it, thinking of it more in, in one particular way. Um, that said, for the course of today's presentation, we are going to be uh, focusing in on computer-based and mobile AT solutions that we can use every day. So Colin, let me give you an idea. The field of assistive tech is really broad. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, we're only gonna focus on computing-based tools, but do you know that we have uh, tools for adaptive aids for, for daily living needs? You can see a lot of examples of it here from a microwave that speaks to a person to an amplified phone that supports a person with hearing loss. We have tools out there for environmental control systems. In the old days, they were built specifically for people who had physical disabilities or vision needs, mm -hmm. but now it's built for the entire general population. Yeah. So that whole area is growing really fast where a person could control everything from a mobile device, yeah. including their front door and their front door locks. Yeah, we see commercials for that all the time for the Nest system, Google has its own system. Yeah, absolutely. And actually there's somebody working right now trying to get this technology out to Alexa where she'll actually be able to understand people with very impaired speech, oh, okay. which can be very valuable to yeah. people. Absolutely. You see a lot of things we do in our field of home worksite modifications. For example, I, I find this fascinating. That's a school desk, I mean a lunchroom desk in a cafeteria in a local public school. So you see how a child with a wheelchair could actually roll up to the, to the table and, and interact with their peers. Mm. We have tools for prosthetics and orthotics, which is a very advanced part of our field. But if you see the, the one on the left, that was made by a parent with a 3D printer for wow. a child that couldn't afford orthotics. In the, in, in the short term, or yeah. it's a backup, and it works really well. That's amazing. Uh, wheelchair seating and positioning is a part of our field, and it's a very specialized area. You can see now we have standing wheelchairs and racing wheelchairs. Hmm. And, the, and the irony here is that, you know, wheelchairs have been around for so long, so it's, it shows you that assistive tech is well over 3,000 years old. Yeah. <laughs> um, tools for hearing loss, from the cochlear implant to hearing aids to using your iPhone now to augment your hearing aids or to augment your hearing. My wife actually has hearing loss. She can use her iPhone in a group of friends so she can actually hear what other people are saying and actually have it typed on her screen what they're saying wow. so she can read it in a noisy area. Hmm. We have tools uh, that are based on Braille and Braille is almost 200 years old now, but now we have Braillers out that allow a person to not only type in Braille and receive information in Braille, but to actually speak um, text to speech so that persons who can't read Braille can actually hear what they're typing or hear what they're trying to convey. We have a lot of tools out there, obviously, for magnification over the years, but now yeah. we actually have things like this, uh, these pair of glasses called an OrCam actually allows a person to look at anything and it will identify it or read it to you. So it doesn't matter if you can see or not. And now here's an example of how a tool benefits more than one group. It's intended for the blind or low vision but it's used also for people with dyslexia. So mm. if a person can't read, they yeah. put on the glasses and it just starts reading to them. The effects of the disability are the same as yours. Exactly. Yeah. Participation. Augmentative communication has been around. This is from the 1920s when they made boards for soldiers that had had their larynxes injured and they couldn't speak anymore. Mm. All the way up to now to putting augmentative communication on a watch. So a child can really quickly say things while they're wow. mobile. That's great. And... Another, the area that we're going to concentrate on today is really computing and alternative access. So these are the old, uh, I think, IBM Selectics. And so it shows you that we had access back then through switches and so forth. We've advanced now to eye tracking and other switches like you've seen. Um, Dr. Stephen Hawking was using, you know, a, chin, a cheek switch, which oh, allowed right. him to do all of his research in physics um, with ease. But now we even have, for example, we can use on an iPhone what they're calling eye tracking, but it's actually head tracking to actually launch apps on your phone just by looking at it. And then finally, the, the final area that's starting to grow in our field is virtual reality, augmented reality, and kinesthetic supports. So on the left, there's a tool here helping kids with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, actually learn to focus and attend to things in their environment in a virtual way, which will carry over to the general um, community. And then the kinesthetic learning for kids with learning and motor issues so that they can interact with educational lessons and actually learn while they're actually doing the therapeutic movements that they need to do. Wow. And then finally, if you want to learn more about the whole field of assistive tech, uh, the University of Connecticut has this oral history of modern developments for 18 education. And it's, it's a great set of um, videos on how the field came about. That's a fantastic resource. Thank you so much. Uh, so just in from your point of view, working at AT Help, who, who generally comes to you, Mark? And you know, how does one become eligible to, 
to, you know, an assistive technology device. In the beginning, we, we saw primarily people with ASD, and, and then everyone started to realize that technology would help them, and, and more people started coming in, and then we decided that we just wouldn't define it anymore. So now it's okay. children and adults with any type of disabling condition that keeps them from participating in the world around them. Okay. Absolutely anybody. As a matter of fact, there's another program at the JCC expanding with us that's going to start serving people with ALS with far more complicated you know, computing needs and communication needs. So what we do at, at AT Help is, m most importantly, try to help people understand and believe that there's not just one way to participate. There's nothing more important than that. They need to be able to know that there's an alternative path to doing what they want to do in their daily lives. Mm. That, you know, I had a man come to me. He was elderly. He had lost his vision. He just wanted to play cards with his wife again. Yeah, sure. Someone else came to me and they said that they needed, they were an artist and they lost the ability to use their hands because of severe arthritis. Mm. And now they wanted to find an alternative way to do their art at work and not lose their job. I've had a lawyer come to me who was dyslexic and was being uh, criticized for his emails and his inability to spell correctly. And so we address that. Uh -huh. And of course, a whole host of issues for kids with disabilities. But the second thing we do here is we really listen to the person's point of view, yeah. especially children, because very often we have all these reports about children, but we don't always ask them, what does, how does your disability play out in the classroom? Yeah, that's right. So to have a child explain to you in whatever way they can that this is what's frustrating, if you address that one thing and help them fix that one situation, then they go back with greater learner confidence Absolutely. and they want to be able to participate more and they start to seek out their own solutions, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. The next two steps really are about envisioning where you could get solutions and what they would look like. I don't want you looking for solutions right away. You need to define the obstacle. If you define the obstacle, then you know yeah. what you want to fix. It's like a task analysis. It really is. Because if you just go and say, well, this is what another product other people use, that's trying to make the product fit the person. Yeah. This is an individualized service. That's right. So you need to imagine what could be for this person and then seek out tools that could fulfill that. Because if you can't find them, it's possible that we can make them. We have a lot of tools oh, that we can make <laughs> things with. A child needed to be able to do algebra in school. We found that the only way they could do it was on a big screen that they could touch buttons and the but buttons would put algebraic expressions in. But well, we made that. It didn't exist. Hmm. And so that's the thing is that a lot of things can be produced. Don't, don't call it quits and say, oh, I can't find anything just because you searched our databases and didn't find it. Imagine what you need and ask. And then, of course, we need to trial it and make sure that it works for that person and then tweak it to their needs. Wow, that is super fascinating and just just being that open i really appreciate what you said you know don't give up like you are so willing to work with anyone who has that need and being able to experiment to find the right type of tool to help them and now, so great. one of the things we tried to do was break this down um assistive tech and and try to figure out how do you look how do you figure out what the obstacles are you can't say that a person has cerebral palsy or dyslexia or multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. and that's their disability okay their disability is their actual encounter in the world and the way they describe it. Yeah. So you have to listen to them and figure that out. And so AT is a way of thinking. Yeah. It's a way of trying to orientate yourself to find out, you know, where's the problem and what are the tools. And yeah. so one of the way I break one of the ways in which I break it down, especially for school, is I try to figure out the participation obstacle. Mm -hmm. And you can see here on this slide that there are a lot of different participation obstacles. Yeah. Um, participation challenges and in input. So in other words, you know, trying to receive information, you're taking notes and you're getting it from the teacher, um, trying to remember, trying to organize your ideas and, and, and bring in information. There are participation challenges of processing, being able to retain information, problem solving, mm -hmm. focusing. There are participation challenges of output, basically graphomotor, trying to write, trying to spell, trying to express yourself. If you're a person that can't speak, it's quite often that it might, it might also impact your writing ability. So maybe you need tools to support that. Even time management. So for someone who is wondering who benefits from AT tools, basically the answer seems to be anyone who has some kind of obstacle along these three areas. So input, processing, and output. Um, but let's make it a little more concrete and based on the, the types of tools we're talking about today, right? Software um, features or apps that are available on our computers or on our phones. So what are some of the most common AT tools in our everyday life that 
people can use on a smartphone or on a computer. Well, that's what's really interesting is that a lot of the people in this audience might already have assistive technology in their possession. Mm -hmm. Anybody that has a modern smartphone within the past, say, five, six, seven years, those phones are all have built-in accessibility tools that people don't even touch. They don't even look for. Yeah, I'm really shocked to see how many people I know that are in my field and they haven't even explored these tools deep enough. Yeah, and I'm guilty, <laughs> guilty as well. You know, I know my iPhone has Siri, but I don't really move <laughs> beyond that, and I'm a little wary of Siri. <laughs> so please give us an overview. Well, on my website at athelp.org, and then also on your handout, there's a part that talks about AT in your computer. That means any mobile device, okay. any computer, any technology like that. And you can see it's for Windows, Macintosh, iPad, and so on, all the way down. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at a few. Um, built into Microsoft, all of these things, since the advent of personal computing, advocates have been asking these big companies to make, them more, make the tools more accessible. So these accessibility features just keep growing literally month by month. There's always something new. But right now, as you see in the accessibility tools for Microsoft, vision, hearing, even for neurodiversity, helping kids with different ways of approaching learning, hmm. um, mobility, and even for people with mental health issues, this, these tools really can support them in helping focus and, and get through their days. Microsoft even has altered their new browser, their Edge browser. Um, you can see the arrow pointing down to um, the word Chrome. What it's trying to show is that it actually can read anything that's on the browser and remove all of the advertisements. This web page has no advertisements on okay. it because the browser cleaned it up okay. and actually started reading it to the person. Oh, okay. You go to Macintosh, the same types of things exist. Um, anything from captioning to audio descriptions of what's going on in a video, um, keyboard supports, mouse supports, even switch controls and being able to talk to your computer. People don't realize that right now you can talk to absolutely any device that you have and it will actually take your voice in. And I, and I don't mean just in the old days, it was maybe someone about 12 years age, 12 years or older were usually the only ones that could use this. I have five and six year olds talking to their devices, kids that perhaps have physical challenges or neuro, neurological challenges mm -hmm. and therefore handwriting might be something difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So I have them speak their ideas right into their devices and then whoever's working with them helps them edit. Oh, that way a child can really get all their ideas. What up. is, what oh, is switch control? Switch control we'll talk about in a second, but it's uh, basically being able to scan through. You see how this red box is around all of those items? Yes. That's kind of like scanning. It would okay. highlight all the different things that you are looking at. Okay. And then it would section go section by section, say descriptions, captions, audio, okay. in little boxes. And then when it gets to the box you want, you hit your switch, and it would pick that selection. Oh, it's a okay. very slow way of accessing, accessing things. Great. But it's necessary for some people. That's exactly how Stephen Hawking did all of his work by literally moving his cheek and previously his finger to control his entire computer. Okay. Huh. Now, if you uh, have the Chrome browser, which is on Chromebooks and actually on Macs and Windows devices, there are a whole bunch of accessibility features. And here we have a link so that you can go and watch their videos and their videos will actually explain through uh, visual and auditory supports about how to set those up. On your iOS devices, otherwise known as, you know, uh, iPads and iPhones, all you need to do is go into your settings area and you'll find the word accessibility. Hmm. So go to settings, general, and then accessibility. And don't forget, these PowerPoint slides are available to you offline, so you can just walk yourself through this yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And in that accessibility area, you'll find supports for vision from voiceover, which a person who's blind or has low vision could actually navigate an entire phone or an iPad without needing to look at it. They can act and it will tell them everything that their hand is on and what they're touching and what they're accessing. Okay. It's amazing. Oh, I don't amazing. recommend people who are sighted to play in this area because you might not know how to get out. Actually, people with low vision are far more skilled at it. You're going to need their help to get out, actually. Huh. Um, Zoom, magnification for people with low vision needs, and even display accommodations like inverting the, the screen so that yeah. it's a darker or more contrast so they can uh, see things more distinctly. Yeah, got it. You go to text-to-speech support, which is really one of the most common things, not just for people with low vision, but also for people who are having any type of reading or writing concerns. This will allow their screen to speak 
or whatever they're writing to speak. And it's really a remarkable feature that I don't see enough people turning on. Um, it allows you to read any web page or anything that's on the device to you with just a swipe of a finger. How long has that been around in iOS? Oh, that's that was one of the first things they probably put on there. Wow. So probably since the advent of the iPad. Huh. But I don't think we have the energy or the power to do some of its better features now. But but being able to touch the screen and have it read to you was it was been around for a, quite a while. This this new feature where you swipe from the top and it just reads everything to you probably came within the last couple of years. Oh, that's great. Like I said, it keeps getting better. And if you see something like this and you use it and you're not pleased with it, you should write to the companies and say something. And I'm going to show you an example of that in just a minute. Okay. Um, hearing supports are remarkable. I had a person come to me and she complained that her hearing aid, even though it was new, wasn't really serving her needs as well as she needed to in certain environments. She connected her, her hearing aid and also a, um, a headset, a regular headset, to her iPhone played with the hearing supports and a couple apps, she told me she was actually getting more crisp speech through her iPhone than she was through her hearing aid in certain environments. That's amazing. So it's amazing that your phones now, whether they're Android or um, iPhones, can actually connect with your hearing aids and actually yeah. give you even enhanced sound and support. Yeah, it's so important. But also under here, you see subtitles and captioning and audio descriptions so that when uh, a video that has these features built in is available, your device will just start to read to you and okay. support. Okay. And you support. Um, touch supports, believe it or not, some people really can't navigate their devices with their hands um, in, in a typical way that's familiar to, to all of us. They might press too hard, especially like little kids yeah. who have any type of uh, neuro, um, neuro, neuromuscular issue going on. Okay. They, they, they might touch too hard or not hard enough. Yeah. I have little kids, they touch very soft. It's really fascinating. And so we need to give them a little support. So okay. here you can actually alter um, the way the device is actually touched. My mom, who had arthritis, couldn't actually um, navigate the device or press the button at the bottom to get to the home. Hmm. So using assistive touch built in here, she was actually able to just lightly tap it and it would bring her to yeah. the home right away. So it's like adjusts the pressure it does. For, for the input there. And that's only getting better and better. They're starting to work on haptic feedback so that a person can actually get some feedback from the device itself and actually push back. Oh, so that okay. you know when you're, you've made a mistake or something's going on where you, when you're navigating. It's, yeah. it's kind of, that whole area is growing quickly. Interesting. And then finally, um, locating uh, scanning support is you know further down in the accessibility list. That, once again, is a place you shouldn't play unless you really know what you're doing and, and you really <laughs> need it. Because to get out of scanning, you're going to have to be able to do scanning. And as you Got see, it. it's highlighting. And then after it highlights, a little button pops up and says, you know, is this what you want? And you touch the screen again or touch a switch, and it will pick that item. Okay. So once again, please don't play in an area that you don't necessarily need unless you're prepared to figure out how to get out of it. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so... And then finally, this is one of the ones that I said parents have fought for and, and, and users have fought for. Parents of kids, especially with ASD, have been saying, listen, my kid's so smart. He wants to get out of this app that I have him in for learning or for communication, and he wants to go play his game. Yeah. So what he does, he constantly presses the home button, gets out of it, and goes elsewhere. Okay. Well, Apple responded with guided access, which you can see on this. This is a communication setup. And at the bottom, I've made these little gray circles and squares. And that's to block the user from touching things that the user shouldn't be touching. Oh, interesting. And I can also say, I can also control the volume. I can control when it goes on and off. And I can control whether they get in and out of any app. And I lock them right in with guided access. Okay. So this is just good for your three-year-old in general. Yeah, so you can set like um, a time limit or something like that? Well, or? you could, but it's also, it will it will actually set itself up for every different app in a different way. Oh, okay. Which is really nice. You can differentiate it. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you don't forget your password or yeah. not only is the three-year-old not getting in, but neither are you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that wouldn't be good. That would be the end of it. Um, and then finally, in iOS, our keyboard supports for the general population, for everybody. From being able to have auto correction on or off, caps lock on or off, check your spelling, and most importantly at the bottom, enabling dictation. Some people will say, well, my iPad doesn't allow me to talk to it. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to turn that on. Um, this only works with modern iPads, I'd say, within the past four or five years. Um, but still, most of the devices that are out there enable you to talk to your device and type with your voice. And uh, something else to point out. Um, don't always, we don't always have to stick with the keyboards that are built into our mobile devices. Mm -hmm. 
So this keyboard actually allows a person to type with their fist. They could actually tap this big block of letters and that big block of letters would blow up and get even larger. Okay. So that a person could actually navigate with just their knuckle or their fist and actually type. Very cool. So there are a lot of amazing keyboards out there. Some cost money, some are free. Okay. That allow you to do um, even more advanced access um, things. And then finally, we're moving on to um, Android accessibility. Android is really underrated with its accessibility features. They're a little bit more complex in trying to find them. I've given you links here that you can go to and actually have them explained to you. Google does a pretty good job of explaining them. But they have amazing features built in for all of the purposes that we just explained in um, iOS. So I encourage you to go and look. They're also more affordable devices. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that parents should consider too. Yeah. You know, especially for the younger kids as they're getting used to it. Unfortunately, iPad usually has a lot more academic tools that we use commonly. So that's why you're seeing it, you know, gain more ground in schools. Got it. Okay. And let's go to our next screen. A lot of the tools that we are using now um, for accessibility are making their ways into mainstream products, which is really remarkable. Microsoft Office has really stepped up and added all of these features and all of these tools hmm. to interact with Microsoft Office so that there, there are a lot of them are free add-ons um, so that children and adults can actually use their tools more effectively. So once you have the software, you can just download like an extension sort yep. of thing? Okay. For example, Office Lens, we'll talk about in a minute, allows you to take a picture of any document and then that document is translated digitally into an editable document right into Word. That's awesome. So, so, a, so a kid gets a handout in class and yeah. it's not accessible. Yeah. Take a quick picture of it with the iPad and then it becomes accessible. Oh, that's super neat. And what's really interesting is I'm starting to play with my own television and to realize that TVs are finally stepping up to be the biggest mobile devices of all. Mm, um, yeah. So we have all these supports from font to captioning to even remotes that talk and that you can talk to. So the control of a television is really becoming um, similar to a lot of the mobile devices in that way. Mm -hmm. Accessibility features are growing quickly. I think more and more people have to comment to the makers in this field, the, the, the industry, and ask for the similar features that they see in their devices. But it's happening. That's no, really great. I mean, what an overview. <laughs> and, and as we mentioned before, uh, Mark's longer PowerPoint is a clickable link in the downloadable packet that you have. So definitely take the time to review those slides that we just covered, some of those tools that we just covered, um, and, and share them with other folks. Um, so gave us an incredible overview. Uh, let's just you know take it one level kind of deeper. So how can these tools really be used and, and for what types of needs? In other words, you, know, you kind of presented more the operating system, built-in features. You also mentioned apps you know, just in passing. So right. what else is kind of out there to, to help with particular needs? Well, there are a lot of free apps, and um, and I'll, I'll warn you. I mean, the, the free apps are wonderful because a lot of them um, are people who are designing things that they're just trying to help their community. And some of those yeah. I'll, I'll show you. And they're yeah. going to stick around for a while, a lot of organizations building apps. But there are also a lot of free apps out there because people are trying to see, would this fly? Would people use it? And okay. then after a while, they'll hook you in and try to you know charge you money over time. The only time that really, really matters to worry about what's the intent of the developer is say with something that you're going to commit to for a long period of time, like a communication app, mm -hmm. something to help a person who can't communicate verbally effectively. Um, a lot of those apps are kind of fly by night. Someone makes them and they realize, wow, this is really neat. Look, I helped the community, but I'm done. I'm going to move on to something else. Okay. Well, they don't update the app. Okay. And so you've invested all this time into using it to communicate with, yeah. and it's not going to be updated. So. Uh, the ones that I've put up here are typically apps that we commonly use in the school system okay. and we commonly use in my field. Good to know. Uh, it's not a, it's not us saying that these are the best, yeah. but they're ones that have kind of stuck around for a while yeah. and, and have, have proven themselves to be uh, something people can invest in. So and I do um, want to just point out, it says handout here. So this, this page is available in the downloadable packet. You either receive via email or you can again download from the bottom of your screen. And I just want to make sure we can access this key. You know, we have these different symbols here. Sure. So can you just help us make sense of that, Mark? So the, as you can see, uh, this is even more confusing maybe, the different things like Chrome, iOS, Mac and Windows, I put a little key next to them, like the plus means that it's found in Chrome. Okay. The greater than sign, you know, means that it's found in iOS. Mm -hmm. And the, the little carrot 
actually means that um, it's found in Android and so forth. I put that little key, I'll go back a second, you can see it's at the top with a square around it. Mm -hmm. That little key up there so that you can figure out where these things are typically found. Now that might change because if something does well in Chrome, it might find its way to Android or it might find its way to iPad. Sure, sure. It's just to get you started to know where these things fit. And if yeah. you need an accessible version of this, because we had to crunch a lot of things together, we'll gladly send it over to you um, in any format that you need. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, let's let's go through them really quickly in terms sure. of time. Um, yeah. I just want to point out what each of these areas are. So AAC or augmentative communication apps, people are familiar with tools like this where they're a symbol or word-based communication tools to help people more effectively get their point across. And I need you to understand that augmentative communication, there are a lot of myths about it. For example, yeah. um, a lot of people talk about when is somebody old enough to use AAC? Well, as soon as they're able to communicate, as soon as they're able to, they have the need to communicate. Yeah. We can put symbols around the house. We can have any type of tool for a person to be able to express themselves and thereby participate. Mm. And what we have evidence on all the tools I'm showing you that they are effective and that they do not inhibit the typical development that everybody hopes that they will slowly acquire. So for communication, people who have used augmentative communication devices have actually ended up with children especially, ended up verbally speaking more over time if they're physically capable of doing that. That's so a really powerful point. It's because, very important. Yeah. And and so you can see some of these myths that we put out there for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think another myth that I've always heard from people is, what if somebody's already talking, do you take this away? The, the time to take away a minute of device is when a person is finished with it, when okay. they tell you they're finished with it, okay. and not alone. But back up really quickly, these are a lot of apps that are out there that people can look at and can explore and see how they can help them, both children and adults. Okay. Move on to a lot of book apps, a lot of apps out there that help people, for example, um, like uh, Bookshare and Learning Ally are the New York State textbooks that are accessible oh, wow. to people who are blind or have dyslexia or any okay. other type of literacy need. And all you need to do is prove that that person has that need and you can gain access either free or affordable. Oh, that's great. But a lot of these supports there help people um, obviously interact with literature more effectively. Yeah. Uh, grammar and spelling, the same thing. A lot of these tools, most of these tools are free until you're probably like of college age. It'll support someone's grammar needs all the way up to college. Mm -hmm. And then for the more advanced people, you know, needs of, of a grammar, like in, in college, like APA style, et cetera, you're going to pay for that service. But okay. for our kids... Basic support is yeah, there. K through 12, it's yeah. there. Good to know. Um, for math, one of the things that people often forget about is that a person can't access, they can't access um, math if they can't access um, writing. Mm, you know, if, 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 if they're unable to write legibly and, or, or at all, then math is also impacted. So yeah, there are so many tools out there to help people actually do math on mobile devices and computers. Uh, there's an example of one built into Google Docs for free, where you can actually do math equations. Looks like some advanced math right yeah. there. <laughs> and a free, <laughs> I, free iPad app that allows you to just type out math, That's not great. a calculator. I love that grid Just type it. it out. Yeah. Yeah. Note-taking, annotation, really big challenge for people. Some of the, the, You should explore all of these tools if you can, because they're all for different types of note-taking. Yeah. Some of them are free, and some of them are cost money and are very advanced and being used by colleges around the city mm -hmm. instead of having somebody scribe for a person with a disability. Oh, interesting. Uh, super simple highlighters are my favorite. So I'll just pass over these quickly, but these are some of my favorite ones for you to look at. And Google Keep, I really think is great. Those are free. Google Keep, so that is that an extension you could get through Chrome or? Uh, yeah, and it actually works on all your, your devices. So okay. I actually have it on my phone too. So it's like a great big sticky list where you oh, can keep cool. all of your information and keep it all organized. Nice. Um, optical character recognition, those are tools that allow you to take something like a handout and make it digital when it's not typically digital. So in other words, if someone gives somebody a handout or, or something to read and they can't read it because it's in physical, you know, in a physical form, you take a picture of it, it'll make it in a digital form mm -hmm. so that now you can use a screen reader to have it read back to you quickly. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to just modify documents and make them accessible for your whole class or for work. That's amazing. Um, Google actually does that itself, Google Docs. You can upload something. You see how I took a graphic image and yeah. turned it into text right there. Yeah. And that's free. Once again, all these tools, I know we're going through a lot of them, but you can come by and I'll explain them to you in person for free. 
Office Lens does the same thing. Take a handout, turn it into a digital doc, and then you can manipulate. That, exactly. Right? So Edit I, it, I change it. Yep. I have something called TurboScan that was really helpful for me whenever I was teaching, right? Because you have students' um, work sample, right? He was working on a math problem. She was working on a math problem. You want to put it up on the board or you want to, you know, make note of it for your own records. And I would use TurboScan to save it as a PDF and then I can just upload it on my computer. But this is like the next level of that where I could, you know, save it as a certain file type, but then could also, you know, change the document itself. Right. If That's teachers really cool. would just do that, if they yeah. would just start to make all of their materials accessible. Absolutely. And you're helping kids with English language learning, you're helping kids yeah. with literacy issues, vision issues, physical issues. Yeah. My goodness, you've helped so many people just by converting your classroom this, to more digital form. Yeah, this would be a lifesaver, yeah. just as a one-off kind of PD that teachers could put into practice. Absolutely. Oh, man. Um, there's a lot of tools up here for occupational therapists to look at. Um, there are tools out there for physical access as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the little T. We saw it changed uh, our formatting. But all you need to know about physical access, because it's a very complicated issue, is that anybody can participate now. We have, mm -hmm. if, if you can breathe, you can drive a wheelchair, because literally you can drive a wheelchair by breathing in and out. Mm -hmm. um, any degree of movement. Stephen Hawking did all of his work with yeah. the slightest movement of his cheek. Yeah. So, and we have eye tracking now. We're even working on brain-computer interfaces where a person can think where they want a mouse to go. So we've That's advanced amazing. to amazing levels. No one needs to worry about that. You just need to know anybody can access. Yeah. Two quick ones I threw up there were Use Hawkeye and the iOS Launch Center. Those are just two areas where you could actually launch things with a physical challenge a lot faster. Okay. Very fun to play with and explore, but those that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there for hmm. people. Organizational supports. A lot of these things help people from, from elementary school all the way up to their workplace. I actually oh, yeah. used one of these tools to organize a dissertation. So these tools help you organize your ideas Absolutely. and to be able to see things with mind maps that actually turn right into um, you know, the, the uh, paper that you're trying to write or, or conceive of. Yeah, and again, any, I'm just thinking from a teacher perspective. So I remember, you know, from graduate school learning that, you know, a graphic organizer alone is considered a type of assistive technology. But then you think about, oh, but like, I know a Venn diagram, you know, very basic ones, or I could make a T-chart. But these are, you know, great tools where you can really, you know, try a variety of different formats to make it really personally accessible for right. an individual student. Imagine a kid filling out that whole concept map of all those ideas, yeah. pressing a button, and now it turns right into an outline for him, saving him time. The greatest challenge for any kid in a school that has a disability is time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to address, time. That's, that's what right. we want to fix for them. And with regards to reading, a lot of supports out there, and not just in the way of of helping someone improve their reading or support their, their visual tracking and their other needs in reading and decoding, et cetera, but also actual materials out there to read. This is called Common Lit, and you see right up at the top, there's a little menu bar that allows them to actually play the story and have it read to you word for word so that you can track along that's great. and visually follow. Yeah, that's Lots great. of tools out here. Tar Heel Reader, a bunch of little interactive PowerPoint books that were made for little kids. Cool. Which are fantastic. Yeah. And then finally, Bookshare, like I said, and Learning Ally are two tools that allow um, our kids in, in New York State to actually have access to accessible materials. Mm. Please explore those if you have a child. Yeah. Seeing AI is an app that I encourage you to download and play with. It's an app uh, made by Microsoft that goes on to your um, iPhone, and you aim it at anything, and it will read it to you immediately. It will even tell you what's in a room, what a product is. Yeah. It's just expanding its gra uh, grasp of you know, uh, the, the physical world to the digital world um, daily. It's yeah. an amazing tool. It's just expanding, yeah. I can only imagine where that's going to be in a few years. And then KNFB Reader for the Android folks used to cost money. Now it's free, and it does very similar things, but it will read just about anything that's put under it for a person that needs it read. That's awesome. Wow. Speech-to-text support. Let's just say that... <laughs> It's all built in now. So into yeah. all those devices, like I said, here's Google Docs. If you go up to your tools in Google Docs and drop down to voice typing, you can just talk to your document without any practice whatsoever. Yeah. And it takes in, like I said, anybody's voice at any age. And, and I learned, although I don't think we have a slide um, in, in the presentation here, but you mentioned that this feature also extends to Google Slides, Google's kind of PowerPoint. Software. Yes. Um, here, I'll get there actually in a second. I'll show you something. Speech therapy for all the speech therapists out there. A lot of tools for them to look at. Yeah. 
text-to-speech, once again, a lot of tools such as a T-bar, which is a bar that just floats in your browser for free, oh, wow. and will read anything on the screen to you, change the background, clean it up, make it easier to read, awesome. but it will read anything to you on your computer. Um, and even Capti, which is free for basic things that you need to uh, read every day that are on your computer. So there's so many tools out there for things to be read to you. That's great. Um, like I said, there was a virtual augmentative reality area, you know, things like FET, which are interactive science simulations and math simulations for kids who might have physical um, challenges or actually um, also to some extent visual challenges. But there are a lot of supports out there for visual supports for kids. Mm. Um, Google Cardboard growing every day, as are a lot of paid apps so the kids can have virtual experiences like traveling into the Grand Canyon when you can't go on such a field yeah, trip yeah. and exploring the world around them. Yeah. Writing supports are a little more complicated. They typically cost money. Okay. But one of the things that's really fascinating people don't seem to know is that built into a Macintosh computers is actual word prediction. It's actually built in. Yeah, so, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, all you have to do is hit the F5 key and it will actually launch word prediction for you right away. But like I said, the other ones are worth looking at because they have more advanced features. And Microsoft Office now is going far beyond just helping you spell. It's actually giving you synonyms and homonyms and actually all these other supports right in it. That's great. When you click, do a right mouse click. What's TTS? Um, text to speech. Okay. So it would actually Got read it. it to you as well. Okay. And then finally, I've, I've listed a whole bunch of materials up here for teachers to look at so that they can make a lot of lessons and things yes. accessible <laughs> Teacher, to kids. Yeah. Teachers take note, please. <laughs> and finally, uh, this list is a list of a lot of other uh, links that I think are really wonderful um, for you to go and explore more areas um, of the tools that we spoke about. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there um, for people to explore. And that concludes our, our real look at the, our list Yeah. For you. But again, amazing. I mean, super helpful survey of, of, of what's there. And obviously, we may not have retained everything that's been presented, but you have the downloadable um, uh, PowerPoint, that, the link to that in your materials. Um, we wanted to shift it over just to working again with, with students. So um, is there a right age for students to start using assistive technology tools, Mark? Well, even in early intervention, like we mentioned, um, children have a right to communicate from day one. They, they just have to. So from a communication and an, another angle, play. Yeah. So a child with a yeah. physical challenge has to be able to play from an early age because most of a child's learning is through play um, if all the way up from early EI to, to elementary school. Yeah. That's how they explore. That's how they learn. So we have to make play accessible. We have to make communication accessible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people will say to me, Mark, what about a kid who has handwriting difficulties or dysgraphia early on? And we're noticing it, that they need occupational therapy. People say, Mark, Mark, we shouldn't worry about giving them a tool when they're, you know, uh, in first or second grade because they can learn how to, you know, use those tools later if their handwriting doesn't, you know, uh, proceed as, as uh, developmentally as we want it to. Mm -hmm. Not true. You have to think of assistive tech as a develop as a as a new literacy and a necessary literacy. Ooh. Everybody uses computers. Yeah. Everybody is going to need to use computers. So as we're teaching a child how to use a pen or a pencil, mm -hmm. we also need to teach them how to use a keyboard and a touchscreen because as they advance in years, they're going to be using both. So when a child gets to 12 or 13 and they really do need to take notes, they now have an option of a pen or a keyboard and they're well-versed in both and we're not making up time. That's right. Those are the, that's how we do this early. Yeah. So it goes back to the idea of promoting agency and, and participation and giving choice. And having foresight to do so. You, yeah. you know your kids are going to be there, so we need to prepare them yeah. for it. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, very, very interesting. Um, so if you're starting to work with a student, how are you assessing the need and choosing the appropriate supports? I think you have to start really simply. I mean, we have a lot of tools out there, and I could connect people to like the WATI, W-A-T-I dot org. And the WADI allows people to go through a laundry list of tasks that kids do in schools, like you said, task analysis. Yeah. And then if you can find all of the breakdowns in the participation, you can slowly fix each one of those with remediation and assistive technology. Could you give a, an example just to help um, us make that link? Sure. If, uh, if we see that a child can't read a handout that's being given to them, are we going to pull them out of class now and go remediate them on their reading? Or are we going to do that later and have that child yeah. participate right this minute? In the moment. So, yeah. right. So, if I have a tool where that thing can be read to them, they comprehend it, they participate, they learn, and they feel empowered because they're doing the age-appropriate stuff they should be doing, 
And then later they're working on the remediation and improving their reading. Yeah. Because remediation takes time and these kids have homework and classwork right now. That's right. And so that's Absolutely. the distinction we want to make. We're not creating crutches for people. These are yeah. not crutches. And I've, I've, I've We're seen, empowering them. Yeah. And I've seen teachers and I've myself have I've just struggled with that in the moment. What's the best way to help the student access this work right here, right now? And you may, you know, you're, you're getting the directive that, you know, you really got to improve those foundational skills during this um, pulling them out of class time. But, you know, they're falling further behind in that class task because the class task is working off of a grade level um, standard, right, or working off of a grade level text. So that's a really great, again, so, great piece of framing. So pick one task, yeah. help improve it for the kid. Not only will you empower them and, and help them become a more confident learner, but now that kid wants to find more tools to help themselves to be able to participate more. Yeah. We have to tell them that here's a tool to participate, and then I have a second obligation here now that you have it do your work. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, That's right. see, you're not getting off. Now yeah. you're actually participating. Yeah. You have a communication device. Now I expect you to participate and yeah. communicate. So there's an obligation on the student as well. Yeah. The individual. Yeah. But it's an, an encouraging sense too. show me all, you know, you right. know, you, you're, you're, you're ready to ready to really bring to the table, you know, everything you wanted to share. And I've never seen a student who's really shied away from <laughs> um, some kind of technology tool, um, you know, that that's, generally only helps them you know students seem to be um, just so encouraged by use of technology in general it is kind of I don't want to over promote it but it does seem to be empowering just from the jump being able to use some kind of technology tool and, and I know that people have a hard time you know breaking away from traditional ways of doing things yeah but you know my mother had a hard time breaking away from a dipped ink pen to a ballpoint pen yeah <laughs> and, and everybody thought the world was going to end when script ended yeah but it didn't and so we have True. we have two tools here and what's what's fascinating is that teachers are using these tools to be able to produce their lessons but kids are still using the 20th century tools of a pencil to do theirs yeah we need the kids to be able to know how to use both tools effectively and well so that as the world changes, they're prepared. Yeah, no, you're right. It goes back to the idea electronics is a new necessary literacy. You need to be working on both levels. Uh, that's really great. Um, I just want to point out um, we're nearing 1250 right now. If anyone has a question they'd like to ask, we'd be, we'd be happy to field that. Um, so noted on, on that end, Mark. Do you have any advice for parents who might be trying to set limits on screen time and device use? I think you already mentioned this uh, before, but you could just give us a little bit more info on that. I think what we uh, need to recognize is that there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different concepts on on what is too much screen time. Um, people off, uh, keep talking about how this is breaking down the family, which I find fascinating mm -hmm. because my father would read a newspaper at the table too. So that's actually not helping much either, is mm -hmm. it? iPad versus you know newspaper. Yeah. But the thing is, it's it's the same as anything else. Just you know, saying that there's a time and place for this, you can actually if that's not working. You can actually have the child use the device in with everybody else at the kitchen table, in the living room, wherever they are. They're not using it off by themselves. But it's also finding tools and supports where they actually play with other kids online, not just by themselves. So mm -hmm. from a social perspective, it's a little deeper. And then finally on that, I would say if that none of that's working, you can actually go into the system and actually regulate all the time, all the tools, everything that that child can do and when they can do it and where they can do it. So that's, that's built into every device. Yeah, no, those are really great guidelines. Uh, we do have a question. Are hearing aids considered assistive technology? Yes, they are. Um, but, you know, it's a far more advanced uh, science, and it, and it has to be supported by audiologists and doctors and, and also possibly a speech therapist participates. So it's – it's and that science is changing daily. Okay. Uh, the hearing aids, it, it's, it's far more advanced than, than what we can talk about today. But, yes, they are considered assistive tech. Mm -hmm. Um, next question, how are you working with the New York City Department of Education or other educational organizations? Well, what we did with AT Train is it allows us to train any school, any organization, any adult program in the entire city or advocacy group in whatever they want to learn about assistive tech. We'll that's be doing great. a presentation to 100 occupational therapists for the DOE um, in May. So that's an example. We can help anyone for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question, what's the best way to help my son with writing if he's resistant to using talk, uh, talk to text in school and he types slowly? And that's what's really fascinating. It depends on the age of the child. I've noticed that children between the ages of 9 and 13, as much as they are the experts in the world of technology, yeah. they are the last ones to want to use it. Because okay. they're so self-conscious that their peers aren't using it, that it makes them look different. When you have a learning disability, very often 
no one, well, no one can see it and you don't want them to see it. Yeah. So by using the computer, the technology in classroom, they feel a little uncomfortable. It makes it visible. So what we have to do is I, I usually try to talk to the child and help them figure out the best ways for them to use the tool until they acclimate to that. They feel more mature about handling it. And so they feel prepared to say to their peer, maybe you should get something to work with too. Yeah. So it, it's a really difficult thing for the kid to want to use. And they have to see, you know, they have to have the support of the adults around them. And a lot of times the adults are saying, well, you can't use a pen. Let's have you use this. Well, both are equal. We shouldn't make a distinction like not using a pen is not developmentally appropriate. It's a very complicated issue, though. And we're willing to be, to be out to see to see your child for free. And come on by. Yeah, absolutely. Take take Mark up on that. His contact information is, is in the download, downloadable packet that you have. Um, and just, you know, given this question just about specific needs uh, for, for her son um, in school and about how you work with the New York City Department of Ed. I just want to point out that, you know, we haven't talked as much about the process for getting assistive technology on a child's IEP. We have a previous live stream that we did a couple years back about um, how to get assistive technology on your child's IEP. Um, there's a link to that in your downloadable packet. If you want to learn more about that process, you could certainly Ask Mark, you know, as you consult him um, about how to best implement um, any assistive technology tools that you've decided on in school. And we at Include are happy to help with any of those process questions as well. Um, we have an additional question. Are eyeglasses considered assistive technology? Absolutely. One of the earliest ones, one of yeah. the earliest designs. <laughs> A friend of mine, Patara, who has dyslexia, says that um, if people don't let her use, say, her devices to do a test, then maybe the people like myself who wear glasses should take off our glasses and do the tests at the same time. Yeah, that's fair right. is fair. I was born with bad vision, yep. so I shouldn't be entitled to my glasses if other people aren't entitled to their assistive technology and supports. That's, again, such helpful framing, how to kind of level <laughs> the way we look at, you know, accommodating a range of learners in a class, the idea of kind of universal design. And I'll also um, point out, although you can't see us, there's three of us in the room right now. All three of us are wearing glasses. <laughs> so that really, really uh, <laughs> rings true for us. Okay, we have an additional question. Oh, okay, additional question. My son is learning to use ClaroScan Pen. Is this an app where we can edit and type out answers on the picture of the document? Are you familiar with ClaroScan Pen? I am, and I'm going to have to remember off the top of my head, but I think you could do that. I mean, there are tools where as you, that's really important for someone. They need to be able to take a picture of something and to uh, annotate right on top of it. And I think Claro can do that, as can some other tools, some free tools. So you have to be able to, you know, a kid gets a handout, they have a do now, take a picture, and then be able to type right over it on their screen and then send that off to the teacher. Um, that does save a lot of time in the class, but it also allows them to have things read to them. So Claro also is doing that as well. Very cool. Um, this is following up on the hearing aids and the eyeglasses. Uh, this looks like, you know, how the Department of Ed is framing you know, the hearing aids and glasses. So per policy, they're not considered AT according to the New York City Department of Ed. So how would one go navigating about that? Well, I had a feeling you were going there. That, yeah. that well, just because we consider it in our field AT doesn't mean that the NYC DOE is going to pay for that. For example, wheelchairs are a better example. Okay. Um, there are different funding sources for those things. So for eyeglasses, for people that can't afford them, there have been, you know, groups that have popped up to help with that. Same with hearing aids as well. In the, in the past, I think the DOE has struggled with that, and there are other vehicles for doing it. For example, uh, things that are durable medical equipment, things that are necessary, like hearing aids, like wheelchairs, et cetera, are usually coming through um, Medicaid, Medicare, insurance, et cetera, because that's, you know, that's really the, the, the resource for them. For example, if the DOE needed that, um, they would actually, if the DOE needs a communication device, they actually get Medicaid um, to actually end up reimbursing for that device. So it is... Just because it is AT doesn't mean it's something that's going to be immediately funded. Mm -hmm. That's a really helpful point. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, additional question, and we might have time for one more after this. Um, my child is waiting for an assistive technology evaluation. What does this evaluation entail? Well, let's make sure that, you know, that all the papers were filed correctly. Um, like Colin said, look at that Parent's Guide to Assistive Technology on the NYC DOE website. Mm -hmm. um, that entails within 60 days of the request, a person or persons will come to the school and they're going to assess the person for the needs that were specifically mentioned by yourself and the schools. So there are forms to fill out. The school should fill out and, and you should help them and the child should too 
describing the participation challenges that that child has in the school so that when the AT team gets there, and that could be an OT, a PT, occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech pathologist, all these people, they come as a team, they look at what you guys described as a participation challenge, and then they try to determine what tools could actually be effective in helping that child participate. Then they hopefully get you a trial of that device, and then the child has to show whether or not it's effective, and then they come back evaluated, and hopefully it's approved for him or her to use. And just following up on that, Mark had mentioned the um, assistive technology parent guide. Um, so that guide is uh, on the DOE's website. If you're not able to find that, you could always contact Include. We'd be happy to share that with you. And for that previous assistive technology live stream that we did, how to get AT on your child's IEP, um, the materials on the YouTube link there, we have a link to our downloadable materials, and that um, includes this AT guide. We're going to take this final question. Oh, actually, it looks like we have one more, and then we're going to wrap it up, guys. And let, let me just keep going on while you bring that question up. Um, with regards to the AT evaluation, uh, if you have questions to report, please come by. And that's what I do with a lot of parents and families, is talk to them about what this entails and how to prepare for it. Okay. Really appreciate that. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any further questions. So, Mark, we want to thank you so much for sharing your incredible expertise in advocacy with us today. I personally learned a ton about everyday assistive technology features that are just there at my fingertips. I now know it goes far beyond Siri. I always suspected that. I saw the accessibility menu, but I've never really explored it um, in this way. And again, as a former teacher, I kind of feel, I feel guilty that I didn't know. So I really appreciate everything you shared. Um, and I hope those viewers here today share this information with families and young people who would benefit from using them to participate more fully in their desired tasks. We wanna thank all of you viewers for tuning in today. We encourage you to review Mark's valuable, comprehensive, full PowerPoint that's linked in your materials packet. And we encourage you to visit AT Help for a free consultation or to call Include NYC's helpline if you have questions about appropriate assistive technology or the process. Uh, this conversation is going to be archived on our YouTube page if you want to share with people in your networks. It should be available within the next week. Um, and as I mentioned before, we had that previous live stream, how to get assistive technology on your child's IEP uh, for any questions around the process for adding assistive technology as a service uh, in school. That link to that live stream is at the end of your downloadable packet. And don't forget to tune into next month's live stream. We're going to be going until the end of the school year. Next month's live stream is happening April 11th, a little bit earlier because of how school vacation is falling. Next month's live stream is on special needs trusts. So thanks again, Mark. We really appreciate your time. Thanks everyone for tuning in today to include NYC Live. Take care and until next time.